lives that we connect to. And that's, there's going to be more on that later, but that's a pretty interesting thing. Can I identify at some point down the road that this was the, you know, the client that connected to, you know, that I connected to and downloaded from? That would be, that would be an important piece of evidence, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how that works. Um, so what they're going to do with these tools is impersonate regular old peers on the network. They're going to engage in activity designed to attract connections, whether they're doing searches uh, or, or um, announcing what they've got. Uh, they'll do queries of their own to find things of interest. They'll inspect the systems that they connect to to look at as much as they can in the shared areas. They'll perform those single source downloads and they log their activity. And this is the game plan, right? We'll, we'll, the, the investigators will go, make themselves a, a good log of what they did, what they found, and they'll use that as the basis for obtaining a warrant. All right, so um, if you were accused of a crime on the basis of a log file, you might like to know, is that log file a reliable source of information? Does it work? Uh, and so people over time, attorneys, have tried to get their hands on these tools because they want to know, how does it work? What does it do? And they are uniformly rebuffed. Uh, nobody's, to my knowledge, ever succeeded in that quest. And there have been times when the court has ordered, the court has sided with the defense attorney and said, yeah, um, law enforcement, cough up, cough up this code or give them access to a working instance of it or something. And uh, the case will get dropped. So they'd rather do that than burn their source. And this is a curious thing. Uh, because on the one hand, they say there's nothing interesting about these tools. They're just simple forks of regular open source software. Uh, anyone could make this. It's not a big secret. And yet, they would go to great lengths to preserve the secrecy. And reason number one that they give is it would divulge our database of you know, naughty files. Uh, and, and first off, I think the software developers in the room just snickered because who embeds the database in the software that they're distributing? It should be two separate things so that you can update the database without having to distribute a whole new build of the code. So it's probably not exactly that. I don't think the database is literally part of the software. But the reason that they give is if we do this, everyone who wants to trade illegal materials will just go and flip one bit in them, and then all of our hash values wouldn't be uh, any good anymore. And while that's true, it works as a two-way street. It wouldn't be any good for the people who are sharing either, because they, not, they would not know if you were out on the internet and everybody you know, claimed to have different files, but the hash values didn't match, how would you know you were getting segments of the same file? So that reason is a little bit shaky to me. Um, but even if everyone did flip bits in their files, that would be so disruptive to the trade of contraband. Maybe you'd want that result anyway. Okay. The code must remain secret. Reason number two, it would disclose the undercover investigators. And here I think they're speaking kind of metaphorically. The, the, the metaphor that they use is, well, you know, if we had um, someone buried deep undercover in a drug cartel, we would use information that they gave us, and that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. We wouldn't identify that person unless and until we absolutely had to. Um, well, this isn't quite like that, I don't think. Uh, but, it, but it's interesting. So I, I can think of two possibilities. And they both revolve around the idea that we don't want one law enforcement agency inadvertently targeting agents of another law enforcement agency, going out on the, on the network and, and seeing, oh, these guys announced that they're sharing all of this stuff. Let's go pick on them. So possibility number one is that nodes know about one another. There's some either central database or, or a list that's published of who's using this software, and that, that way you can identify your friend on the network and you don't go and, and pick on them. Um, this also is probably not part of the software itself, but maybe the software contains the, the means of obtaining that list or something, and that list really should remain secret. We, that, that's a legitimate secret. Um, but I don't think that's it, because from time to time they will give you the log file, and that contains their IP address in it, so that that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So the other possibility is there's something distinctive in the way the tool does its initial handshake. So when the, when the, when the two peers connect, when two peers connect, they'll exchange some information. Usually uh, they'll have a globally unique ID or something like that that it exchanges. And there might be something unique in that handshake that would identify this as 
a non-traditional uh, peer to peer plan. And I think that's a pretty likely guess. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because this is how the, the tagging feature works. All right, so we have some problems with not being able to look at the software. And one of them is just the reliability of the software. Does it ever erroneously make a report? Well, it's quite common, I can tell you from my own experience consulting with attorneys, it's quite common that investigators, when they go and they seize a the computer, they don't find the files that they say they downloaded from that computer. That happens well over half the time. There are two explanations for this possible. Uh, one is the files weren't there in the first place when the report is wrong. And the second is um, they don't usually execute their warrants until months after they did the initial download, so the file's just not there anymore. Uh, and that, that's probably pretty likely. But uh, what we don't know is how many warrants have they obtained and executed that didn't result in an arrest. We don't see those. That's stuff that never makes it across the attorney's desk. And so we don't know. So we don't know if they're false positives. We don't know if the, the tool's false positive rate. And that, I think, is a worrisome thing. And there are there conditions under which it malfunctions? Well, I'm here to tell you this software has bugs. And I mean, <laughs> we wouldn't even have this conference if that weren't true. <laughs> he's shocked. He's, this is the first he's heard of it. Um, I can't imagine why we should think this particular software has less bugs than any other. And it might be useful to know what they are. And there's been no review of this. Um, the government just says, yeah, it works. The next problem is the standard for obtaining a warrant. In order to obtain a warrant, you're supposed to establish probable cause that a crime might be committed. And this isn't technology. By definition, this isn't technology that's in the hands of the public. There's a really interesting case from the, the turn of this century uh, Kilo or Kylo, I'm not sure which it is, versus the United States, where the, uh, the feds used the forward-looking infrared radar to visualize what was going on inside of a house. And the, the Supreme Court said, you needed to get a search warrant for that. You can't, just, uh, you can't just do this. This is stuff that's outside of what the public could, could have. They can't, it violates their reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and I think that's the case here, too, that nobody thinks that there's a tool out there that does this, and it's not in our hands. We can't examine it. We can't see it. Um, and again, this is where the government trots out this, well, this is just modified open source software. Any user could do the same thing. Well, that's parsical. Maybe any software developer could, but most users are not those. But it sort of raises the, the supplementary question. How would we know we were doing the same thing if we can't see the tool to begin with? Yeah, maybe we could. Right? Maybe we could write any kind of software, but how would we know it works the same way that the government one does? Um, and that brings us also to tagging. Right now, there are when you're using these tools, there are shared areas on your computer, so folders full of things that you're willing to share on the peer-to-peer -peer network, and then there's the rest of your computer, which is supposedly off-limits. When the way the tagging works is in that initial handshake, the, the law enforcement software will submit a blob of data that's going to get written to a log file. In, in Nutella, that's the clients.net file, the list of clients that the thing is connected. Uh, that's not in a shared area of the computer, and it contains now a blob of data that the government wrote, and then later, when they come and go through the log, they'll say, yep, this is the one we wrote. It's encrypted with our, our, our key. Uh, so is that something you should have to get a warrant for? I don't know. Uh, that's an unlitigated um, question right now, or there's been litigation, but we haven't gotten a sensible result. Uh, the next thing is, what are the chances you're going to find a judge who's able to tell whether these statements are reliable, that how IP addresses can be connected to subscriber identity, how peer-to-peer -peer networks work, um, how a government tool based on open source software works. Judges don't know this. They just get a 20-page warrant after they and they say, uh, okay, sign. Uh, because they don't have a choice. It's, it's that or conduct a really serious investigation of their own, and it's not going to happen. Another thing is who's qualified to testify about how these tools work in court? You usually see the investigator who operated the software come and say, this is what I did on this and such a night. But that person can't really explain. That person is trained in how to use the tool, 
but doesn't necessarily know the inner functioning you know, that, the, that the developer of the tool would know. Um, so I, I think testimony ought to require more than just knowledge about which button you click to make a single switch download happen. And then, of course, again, software ha having bugs, it might be exploitable uh, to a, a really enterprising person. Um, you know, these, these things we know, there's Java-based stuff, there's .NET-based stuff, there's, you know, the, the, the clients that the, the tools are derived from. Any bug that those have, this probably has too. Um, and it may have its own bugs too, of course. Uh, and, and one of the things that we've got here is the exploitation would probably go undetected because of this lack of transparency that we've got. And because it's mostly not used by security professionals, it's mostly used by investigators and they might just not even notice that their software crashes in a funny way one day. All right, um, I have, I think, about one minute left. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, okay, I have one, one. Uh, so I could do like a question, somebody's got one. All right, well, thank you very much. And thanks for coming to my talk. See you again soon. Okay, that's why it's not so long. Dann schauen wir gleich mal, was man danach noch so pumpen kann. Ähm ja. Bin ich hier safe? Ja. Ähm Höre ich meinen Sound überhaupt? Schon, ne? Hm. Hm. Okay, es ist gleich Tag, dann warte ich bis Tag ist. Ja, passt. NSA Talk Cyber Security. Okay. Mm. And right now, can I just speak for uh, Rob Joyce again? Let's give a big deck off. Ja, wieso nicht schon mal rein? Okay. Also von Rob Joyce, DEFCON 26, NSA Talks Cyber Security. Ist ja lustig, dass einer von der NSA bei der DEFCON spricht. Die werden noch mal gehältet auf der DEFCON. <lacht> So the other reason I'm here is, again, to be part of this community. Um, so 
what you will find, whether you know it or not, there, there are and have been and will be SK people involved in DEF CON throughout the years. Um, you know, I'm up here to the no words on my head. I'm a real person, I'm a technologist at heart. Um, if you want to see kind of the things that get me pumped and excited tomorrow at noon, I've got another talk. I'm talking about my house and a Christmas light display I put on every year, building a certain Christmas lights. Um, that one actually might be more interesting. I shouldn't say that as you sit here and look about to listen to this talk, but that's uh, that's a cool talk. So come over to DEF CON 101 tomorrow. It's not in the program, it's an ad. Um, so I'm happy to be able to do that. So so why am why why am I and others at NSA? Um, it, it really is um, to focus on that technology and think about um, serving the country and, and, and providing a, a way to make this place safer. Because as I talked throughout this morning, you're here, and I hope you'll agree that there are some really bad things, some bad trends going on um, on the internet through through cyberspace. And, and I feel like each and every day I get a chance to push back on some of that and really try to drive toward better uses of that internet community. So um, you know, the year after Snowden. Um, when it was a no feds allowed, I came to DEF CON. Um, I didn't come on NSA's nickel, I didn't come as a fed, I came as Rob Joyce, but to stay involved in the community. Um, I think it, it, was, uh, it was interesting that a lot of people knew me, I had done meet the fed panel the previous year. So, you know, they looked at me and knew I was from NSA, but I was still, you know, greeted and, and part of the community that was going on here. So that was pretty cool. It was, uh, it was notable that you know, I think it was two years ago, I was going up in the, in the elevator to a sky talk, and somebody turned and said, hey, aren't you that NSA guy that talked to our cybersecurity club? So um, all the heads in the elevator snapped around. They looked at me, and I owned it. I said, yeah, absolutely. And we started a conversation with the whole group there. Right? And, and that is, um, that's what I want you to see. If you see me in the halls, come up, have a conversation. We're real people. I know not everybody at DEF CON agrees. Um, with NSA and our mission and, and the types of things uh, that, <laughs> that are said about us in the press sometimes. Um, but I'm hoping I will show you that you know, there really is no one intent, there's important things to be done, and, and we're invested in do, doing those kind of things. So um, let, me, let me hop straight into it. For those of you who are un unfamiliar with NSA, um, there's really two sides to NSA. There's the signals intelligence mission that's focused on um, getting out there and producing intelligence on threats to the country for decision makers, for law enforcement, the military, and trying to trying to pursue that. And then there's the information assurance side that does cybersecurity um, for our national security systems, the highest levels of, of information that we in the U.S. government has to protect. So with that is the basis of kind of where I'm coming from. I'll jump in where I think things are going. So, so I'll start here with this slide that talks to the inflection points of the, uh, the technology landscape. Some big pieces of that. One, um, That's kind of a good side. They're really, really growing and, and, uh, and exploding in the um, Another big thing is people are choosing to supply their data, choosing to supply their data to, to those massive social media sites. Um, and, and what's happening there is funding much of the web and shaping the ecosystem with that big data analysis and, and the advertising that they can serve up. And so you've got to kind of think about that in terms of the, the direction technology is going because that's what's funding a lot of this, right? And so if, if you don't acknowledge and understand those components, um, you're, you're going to miss the boat about where technology is going. So if you look at the technology explosion from the 2000s to today, there's some really big points. Um, 2015, we broke through to the point where half the population of the world is online. That is all the people in impoverished countries to the wealthy and sophisticated high-end technology companies. Um, half of those people have access to the internet for some means. And in 2014, Mobile internet surpassed the fixed internet, so we're living on that cell phone device. Oh wow, and that sucks. Wieso spreche ich Englisch? They're connecting us, but it also um, they're really powered by the back end big data um, that, that exists in the cloud, and and that is a, a feature and an aspect of where we're headed in technology that you got to consider in how we're doing uh, security. So for us in the U.S., more than any other nation, I would say, we depend 
on the availability, the integrity, the authentic, the authenticity, the information on those nets, and really, unfortunately, those vulnerabilities to exploit um, those networks are, are being um, being exploited by criminals and nation states. And so we've got to think about um, what we need to do to change some of those dynamics. Uh, I talked about the technology, now let's talk about the environmental changes. Key yeah, aspect for me is um, in the nation state arena, the focus has moved from using the realm of cyber to steal secrets to using that realm to impose national power. Um, notable big incidents the last couple of years, we had huge data breaches so on the slide that kind of moved from espionage focused ops to a growing trend of large scale destruction. And you all lived through a couple of big notable um, internet events in the last couple of years. I also think it's noteworthy how numb we've become Right, um, when a cryptocurrency exchange in Japan lost $530 million in, uh, in a cyber theft. So this may be skewed because the audience we're in, but how many heard of that in January when you know a half a billion dollars of cryptocurrency was taken? So it's so, also, I don't know if you have this not talk, 2018. Uh, hmm. not as much. And I think it's incredible that you know, half a billion dollars walks out um, if that happened and it was a truckload of gold stolen from a bank, imagine, you know, above the fold headlines, but oh, on another cryptocurrency, um, you know, session was uh, was hijacked and lost half a billion dollars. Um, we were really growing on in that. There were also pretty concerning reports back in January that caught my attention. Um, that was the Triton malware reports. If you think about the the targeting of safety systems in industrial control in big industrial processes um, that is um, that activity that you've got to start to wonder about the judgment um, that came to light not because somebody was really investigating and found it through extensive cyber sleuthing it came to light because they weren't doing a really good job in that uh, in that safety system and caused notable outcomes uh, so to so me the judgment of those people who thought they should be screwing around with a safety system without the knowledge and capability to actually manage it and shape it um, in the way that they were seeking um, just, just shows how dangerous they are in that. And it probably should scare each and every one of you. I know it scared me to think about the folks going into that. So we're also seeing countries use the national power in other ways. Um, China is using its cyber infrastructure to establish a social control system, right? the, the, the um, social credit system that they're rolling out. So that's another way to use the power of cyber technology and for some of the national aims. And so, you know, for me, the way it compares and contrasts the free world to some of the totalitarian regimes is how we're using those, those elements of technology to either defend against abuses or prop up some of the social injustices that are happening. So you got to be aware of the new threat landscape. The tools are available, the data is out there, the intent exists, and that's intent, um, the trajectory of that intent is the piece that worries me. I think nation states and criminals opposed to some of our basic social order are having their way in the digital domain, and I would lump the election hacking and other things into that as well. So make no mistakes. Um, a big concern is the, the chance for miscalculation is huge, and whether it's trying to influence our elections or intrude on the safety systems of industrial plants, that's something we as a community can have to rally against and, and deal with. So continuing on the cyber threats, um, I'll talk about four major trends that, that, uh, that, that are um, on my radar. Criminals and foreign adversaries constantly prowling this digital domain. Um, they, they, they push on America's digital infrastructure continuously um, and those of other places in the world. First area, um, high-end sophisticated actors. There's really been a fundamental shift in the nation state activities opposed to free and open societies. Right? Aggressive, destructive cyber operations, um, asymmetric intrusions, inflicting damage, um, rapid weaponization of disclosed capabilities. 
these state sponsored actors are continuously building on the technique. So, what we'll see is some elite folks at the high end of that um, coming up, innovating, but quickly propagating that down a scale uh, to other folks who can, who can use it and turn it. Um, people fear zero day exploits, but really, hiding in the account of an unauthorized user um, is much more hard to ferret out um, over the long haul using uh, authorized processes in ways that, that weren't intended. And, and so that, that expertise of the high-end folks who can figure out how to insidious, insidiously get themselves into your processes, your, your data as an authenticated user, um, makes it really hard to, uh, hard to deal with. So we're seeing those big, splashy cyber events with increasing frequency kind of reinforcing that numbness. Um, and as I discussed earlier, um, just getting commonplace. Second area, um, the level of expertise is decreasing. You know, the, the quality of tools released, the ability to get and build yourself on the shoulders of others um, and get out there is, um, is uh, really a leverage factor in enabling bad activity that's going on. So most advanced members of some of these overseas groups create the tradecraft and then again bring others along um, unhinged to responsibly guide the use of those activities. Third area I highlight, um, the move from exploitation to disruption. For the last few years, a number of dis uh, destructive attacks, uh, top of mind for me is uh, Russia targeting Ukraine in an ongoing uh, conflict. They wound up inflicting on the world with WannaCry, right? It was aimed at Ukraine, did a supply chain exploitation in Ukraine, um, but quickly propagated to the globe. And if you look, a significant number of maritime ports were shut down, the shipping channels disrupted. Uh, that's real world physical impact. The supply chain of our modern businesses rely on those shipping channels to follow a predetermined predicted, predicted timeline. And by shutting down those ports, impacting those things, um, it had huge impact around the globe. There was a non-binding resolution out of the UN in 2015 where a group of governmental experts said, hey, one of the important norms we have to establish is um, that we won't intentionally damage critical infrastructure. We've seen um, disruption of civilian power. We've seen financial institutions um, knocked down. We've seen a lot of preparatory activity in critical infrastructure. And that stuff has no purpose other than preparation for these types of attacks. So that's, that's the trend line of the cyber threat that, that continues to work. Fourth area, um, the growing use of information operations leveraging cyber intrusions. And so that's the story of where you can get a hack, grab data, weaponize that data, and then make outcomes from that data. Um, every single day we've got adversary producing campaigns, pursuing campaigns to achieve those strategic outcomes. Um, and many of those campaigns have cyber components. Um, when these people take our intellectual property in a big campaign, um, any given single theft is just that, it's a theft. But when you look at it as strategic intent over timeline, um, that really is a cumulative effect on our national economy. And uh, national security implications really are undeniable of campaigns that are looking to affect our, our our intellectual property and, and business chains. So in America, we have um, the luxury of thinking about national security as an away game, right? I think in, by that I mean um, many of the complex wars and activities in our lifetimes have taken place overseas. We've been insulated from that. Um, but cyberspace has made it clear that we're no longer in an away game. The threat has really come to us. And, and that, you know, as cyber professionals or people interested in this technology, um, has to be a, a fundamental truth that you've got to absorb and think about um, how that changes uh, the way we need to react and work. So the new threat environment, not only has that threat changed, but the environment around it has changed. I talked in the very first slide about information technology game changers. Um, the connectedness of our life is exploding. Sensors abound around us. If you think of the Internet of Things, the amount of data that's, um, that's pulled together, and we can expect criminals to go ahead and look at exploiting and weaponizing that environment. So it's an escalating threat environment that have 
be motivated to fundamentally look at how we protect ourselves and protect national security in that space. So I hope I set the table um, for, for the background. I don't think any of that's hugely surprising, but what I wanted you to do is kind of walk with me thought to thought and, and get a sense of where that's been and where that's going. So at NSA, we're lined up with those two missions I explained earlier. Um, what we found is cybersecurity benefits from the union of those two things. Um, the signals intelligence mission goes out, gives unique insights into foreign threat actors, ensures that the national security systems are equipped to defend against those kind of trends that I talked about. Signals intelligence really is at the core of NSA's fundamental advantage in doing security. And so we can take and discover threat intelligence on foreign adversaries. We can inform our partners, DHS and others, to go out and take action in that space and, and both tactically counter the ADA malicious activities or support the, the entities that can go out in a more strategic environment and degrade and defend against those who go after our freedoms in our, in our institutions. So we focus on providing deep expertise to the U.S. government on the targets, the technologies, the cyber defense tradecraft we have to work, um, and there's a lot of partnerships in that. So in the U.S. government, um, we approach these threats as a team. DHS provides the mitigation role, FBI um, does an investigative role, and then we underpin both of them with support and the expertise in the nature of the foreign threats. I told you I'd walk a little through history, too. Cybersecurity at NSA has been on this, this, this journey for a while. Um, we've been working on the information systems and the comm systems of national security since 1953. So over 60 plus years, we've not only produced the security policies, but we've done that hard work of deploying and developing the secure products and services that implement those policies. And that's kind of a unique place to be, not only just writing policies, but being a practitioner of it. And that's one of the things that helped me in the White House was knowing that what we do and how we do it and what others do against us on top of writing that policy was so beneficial. So then 40 years ago, um, we were in the security business. It was communication security or concept. That was really almost exclusively about protecting classified information as it traveled between two points. So we wanted to keep it from an authorized disclosure. Um, we did that by building very secure black boxes, right? Goes into, unencrypted, goes out, encrypted. Um, High-grade encryption, careful engineering to protect that information. In the 70s, even in the early 80s, the advent of the personal computer came around. Um, we had a new discipline for computer security or CompuSec. That was still focused on protecting the information on unauthorized disclosure, but it also started to address additional challenges, the, uh, the injection of malicious code or the theft of large amounts of data on magnetic tape, which really transitioned into that human information realm. Um, we saw a big CompuSec contribution back then with the Rainbow Series of books. These were description by the government telling everybody how we could protect um, um, trusted systems, evaluate them with guidelines on things like passwords, um, audits, network databases, risk management. Um, it was stuff in the 70s and 80s we were talking about doing all the same problems we're talking about today, right? Um, I think um, it was the time where we were first questioning how you could Okay, ist wieder eine halbe Stunde. Ich mache hier kurz einen Cut mal wieder.